Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. In the last few sessions of our quick trip through the Bible, we're going to be looking at some of the issues in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Let's take your Bible and open it to 1st John, and we'll start right with the very uh, first verse. This is an interesting statement, and we wonder why he made it, and we can discuss that. Mm -hmm. But here it is, from the very beginning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This is a, 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 a bunch of hands-on talk, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Why? Well, that's a good question. Uh, as you know, the Apostle John, that famous beloved disciple, wrote uh, five books in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, and then these three quite short letters, and the book of Revelation. Now, there's pretty good evidence to suggest that Revelation was written first, and then the Gospel of John was written, and then these three letters were written. So, think also, about... At what period of time was that in the first century? Well, this would be between, <coughs> probably between 90 and 100 A.D. So this is 30 years at least after, after everything else in the New Testament was written. So would it be uh, fair to uh, say that John's writings here, and I'm talking about the Gospel and these letters, were t intended to correct some of the misunderstandings that were going on uh, at, at that time? Yeah. This was written to a second, at least a second generation bunch of Christians, not first generation Christians. And remember what you remember from uh, uh, Revelation 2, actually, the, what talks about the, the church at Ephesus. People were starting to slip away. They were trying to, you know, not, they weren't on fire for the gospel like the Pauls and the Peters and the Johns back in the first generation. So people are slipping away. And what's happening is that some of the Greek thinking of those days was slipping into Christianity. Now, Greek, of course, was the sophisticated language and thinking and culture of Jesus' day of around the Mediterranean world. And remember that from the days of, of uh, Plato, it was believed that anything material, anything you can touch and handle, and that's hands-on kind of stuff, anything like that was inherently evil. But the spirit, anything that you can't touch, the, the, the spirit, the essence of, and each one of us, in fact, was a, is a person that's basically a, a cage, which is our body on the outside, but we have a spirit inside, a soul inside of us that, of course, comes in at the time we're born and disappears and goes elsewhere at the time when we die. And those kind of thinking, that kind of thinking was slipping in to the Christian church. This led to a couple of different approaches, and, and, and let me just mention some of the problems that led to in the church. The basic issue in the church was this. If you believe something is material, is evil, like this table here. 
and that God is pure and spiritual. And that, well, I mean, uh, maybe I'd better take a, a, a little more different example. If you believe that my body is evil, or it, all of our bodies are evil, then a, a pure God, can, as a spiritual being, cannot come and live in an evil body. So you have this problem. And an example that's still carried over from that idea is the idea of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Uh, I used to think when I was younger that the Immaculate Conception t was talking about the birth of Jesus. No, it's talking about the birth of Mary. And the idea was that Mary would have to be a perfect human being, otherwise she could not, uh, the, the, the baby, even the baby Jesus, couldn't dwell within her womb because you can't have a perfect baby living in an evil womb. So that's where that idea came from. And that was not a biblical concept. No, it was this not was a biblical a made concept. Up yeah, it was, it was a came thing that came out of Plato Platonic thinking. Yeah, yeah. It also led to other kinds of things that, um, and let me give you a couple of examples. There were two versions of this Gnosticism, uh, and the Gnosticism basically was the idea that evil is down here and God is up there, and, and there are certain steps between, and if you know the right things and you do the right things, you might be able to advance up a few steps there. And in order for God to come down and work here on this earth, he would have to come down some of those steps. So, so maybe somewhere in the middle you might be able to meet, possibly. So um, the, the, a couple of versions about the life of Christ. Of course, the life of Christ is what made this a real problem because you can't possibly have an, a perfect God being in the same body with an evil person. Um, but in verse 2, mm -hmm. he takes that on... Yeah. Straight on. It yeah. says, For the life that was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, yeah. which was with the Father. So he's taking the hands on exactly. and saying that's eternal. Yep. Well, I'm, now how did he get, he must have been steeped in that, in that kind of thinking. Well, sure, he was very familiar with it. Yeah, so what turned him around that he could finally say this? Well, because he knew Jesus, and he knew very well that this was no... Now, remember, let me just finish up with my thing. There are two versions of what they tried to do with, with Jesus, and these, these thinking people who thought like Gnostics. One was called Docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, Docetism. The Docetists believed that um, when Jesus came down to this earth, he was, it wasn't really a human being. He was a phantom. He was a a ghost, if you will, but he acted like a human being, he talked like a human people, people like a human being, people thought he was a human being, but he wasn't really. So to them, God came down, he acted like a human being at, at his crucifixion, resurrection, he disappeared back to heaven. He never was completely human. He was fully God, but he was never fully human. Could you and, touch him? Well, they would have questions, they would have serious problems with him, t with touching him. With touching him? Because he's not supposed to be material. Material is evil. How in the world did they hold on to him and nail him to the cross? Well, I mean, that's a lot of questions raised by that, yes. Also, in, in the scripture, perhaps you could point out to us or let us know that somewhere in there it says that if someone says that he did not come in the flesh. That's here that, in this gospel. That there's a problem with that person, yeah. a very horrible problem. And then a second point, I wanted to clarify something. The first, second, and third books of John, were they written in that particular order? Probably. Okay. Probably. I have a question. Okay, these Greek philosophers were in the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. Empire and um, they thought of these systems. I mean, Jesus said what he was and what he came, but they disregarded that, and in their little think tanks, they came up with these new philosophies. I remember uh, th that this philosophy was there way before Jesus showed up. Oh, it was. Well, yeah. Philo in well, the Judaism was, was brought that stuff in from. Yeah. Uh, well, I was wondering, what is the reason for this kind of philosophy? What does it let the human do that maybe, um, I mean, why would people think up this kind of thing? Well, it's a good question. Uh, one of the explanations is this. They believed that the souls were, were waiting out there somewhere, maybe in space. I don't know exactly where they thought they were waiting. And then when a baby is born, 
one of those souls, at some point in that process, the soul comes into the body. Mm -hmm. The body is kind of a cage or a prison, if you will, for the soul. And you live during the course of this life as, as, a, as a soul caged in this body. And then when the body dies, the soul escapes and goes off to the next existence. So it was a way to try to explain what happens to people after they die. And then they would be guaranteed that they would be living after death. Yeah. And everybody would be floating someplace. What I'm, tr what I'm getting at is Sorry. when I know... Why did, Plato, why did Plato come up with this? Well, I know that when my students wanted to do something, mm -hmm. they would come up with the Everything. reasons and theories and everything. And so I was wondering, since none of this was in the Bible, these, guy, these original thinkers that were in the think tanks, why they thought up these things, what, what purpose did it serve for them? That's what I was curious. So yeah. the first one is that um, people all float up and... Uh, it to, explains what happens to people after they die. Yeah. Well, well, I don't know. I think it's obvious that, that there was a movement there to confuse people what sin was, don't you think? Possibly, but remember Plato was several hundred years before yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I know, but sin is sin, and it's been here ever yeah. since the Garden of Eden, and so whatever is being developed here is going that direction. I mean, sin goes against the character of God. That's mm -hmm. what it is, and look what they're doing. They're turning it into some physical thing or some floaty thing over here, yeah. but not about God's character. Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> I think one time I heard you say that if the body is sinful and the soul is pure. It doesn't matter what you do with the body. You can, you can carouse, well, you can do whatever, because it's sinful anyway. Mm -hmm. And so you could party hardy, and your soul is still clean. Well, that was one of the, that's the antinomian version of Gnosticism. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. There's two more things we need to talk about okay. before we jump into this fully. Let's go back to Cerinthian ism, which is the opposite or, or at least different than, than, than the docetism. The Serinthus is the one who came up with that idea, said, no, Jesus was fully human. He was an ordinary human being who lived his life, but when it came time for his baptism, what actually happened is a, is a spirit or a, some essence from God came down and took control of this human body and controlled it during the ministry. So he was one, it wasn't Jesus by himself that was actually doing this, it was this, this spirit or whatever that was controlling him that was responsible for all his actions. But then at this crucifixion, the spirit disappears again and what dies is the human body. So the Corinthians believed that God was, I mean, Jesus was fully God, I'm sorry, that he was fully human, the body, the human body, etc., was fully human, but it wasn't fully God. So one said fully human, the other side said fully God. So what did they think happened to the body? When it, was, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No. So the, the resurrection means nothing. Mm -hmm. The resurrection isn't a big deal. And what was the spelling of that? Cerinthium, C-E-R-I-N-T-H-I-A-N-I-S-M, Cerinthianism. And so John was writing this letter to... The people had those kind of thinking. It was creeping into the church? Yes. And there was the antinomians we already talked about. These people said, our, our bodies are hopelessly evil already. There's nothing we can do about that. We'll just keep our souls pure inside there somewhere, and our body can do whatever. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Sexual immorality, whatever, none of that really matters because we're keeping our souls pure. Okay. okay. That was that. The other, on the other side, they were going to the extreme, which ended up with monasteries and, and nunneries and so forth. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to do any, anything that's pleasant to the body must be sinful. So if you're a real saint, you're skin and bones, you don't want to eat any more than you absolutely have to, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's the other extreme. Wow, all this was coming into the church. Yeah. yeah. Others still would beat themselves silly when they did something wrong. Yeah, that was another part of it, yeah. So John is trying to deal with these things, and he's, he's in almost certainly in Ephesus as he's writing these things. He was, remember that they had thrown him into a pot of boiling oil, and he didn't cook. They took him out, sent him to the Isle of Patmos, thought, okay, that'll take care of him. He, out in the Isle of Patmos, he, he, he wrote the book of Revelation. 
then the guy who was doing all the persecuting died, and so he was freed from the Isle of Patmos. He comes back, he writes the Gospel of John, he writes these three letters, and he is basically the saint. He's the elder. He's the elder statesman of the Christian church, the Gentile Christian church of his day. All the other apostles have died. John, we're pretty sure John was the only one who died a natural death. And not, not that the Roman world didn't try to take care of him. But How old was he? Probably somewhere around 100. Mm -hmm. He was pretty, maybe, maybe back, maybe only 90, but somewhere in that range. Went now, through the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah. Now, he was a fisherman, so he wasn't that educated to write this way, was he? Did he have helpers? Uh, we, he doesn't mention helpers. He, he may, he probably, very likely he did. We just don't know for sure. Um, he writes it, this in the first person plural, though. Yeah. We this, we that. Yeah. Was he writing from Ephesus, do you think? Or? Almost certainly writing from Ephesus, yeah. He took uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, with him. This is, then. there's some difference of opinion about this, because obviously we don't have a lot of information about it, but it's thought that either Mary died, and at that point he left Palestine and went to Ephesus. Some think that maybe he took Mary with him, because remember on the cross, Jesus said, you know, take care of mother and so forth like that. Uh, it's it's a possibility, which we can't prove, that John was actually the cousin of Jesus. So it might be appropriate for her. And he may have come from a, a schooled family, if you will, because didn't he have some type of relationship with the priestly clans Probably there? Probably sold them fish. Well, I thought, <laughs> I thought he was able to get in he was. somehow yeah. because well, they the knew him. The high priest knew him. Right. Get it, get he was pretty what? young. He was pretty young, though, when he was a disciple. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when they're so young, they can still learn mm -hmm. yes. a lot of things. And just yeah. think what they did said about the other disciples. These guys aren't educated, and let's look what they're doing. So what we have then, in the, in the Gospel of John, the first few verses confirms his belief that Jesus was fully and completely God. And here, the verses that Norm read to us in the first epistle of John confirms his belief that Jesus is fully human. So he's not taking any flack from anybody. He's stating his convictions just like that. And uh, What so do you think could have happened if that, that idea kept going? What, what do you think he was really scared of? Other than that wasn't the truth, but... Well, not the truth, but his, his concern would be that you end up with Jesus being, you know, you're not quite sure, and, and there's going to be two sides fighting. You know he was this, yes he was that, no he was, he was this, he was that, he was the whatever, and you end up basically tearing the church apart, and people yeah. want... It is a great controversy between Christ and Satan. So Satan does everything through every organization, through all the people that he can, to degrade the, the, the notion of a Christ. Mm -hmm. Deceive. Deception. Yeah. Deceive, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we come to, to the, the little uh, uh, short book of 1 John, and one of the first sections we come to is the first part. After John, Norm has read us some of the first few verses. Turn now to... Let's start with really from verse 7. I guess I should get over there. And my, uh, You'll notice something interesting if you've been watching us for a while. When we started this study a number of years ago, we were all using Bibles. Every one of us had a paper Bible here. <laughs> now I see we've got, we've got some people with the old-fashioned book Bibles with a variety. Some of them look like they've been somewhat worn. Um, We've got some people with Bibles and computers, and we have some people with just computers. I got a I, phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like my computer here. It's got about 50 Bibles in it, so it's easier for me to... Uh, I want to go from this one to that one to another one I can. But let's go down to 1 John. I'm going to, let's start with actually verse 5. Now, the message that we have heard from his son announces this. So John is going to, in, in his gospel, in these three letters, and in the book of Revelation... God, John is making one huge assumption. He's writing to Christians in a time when Christians are under persecution, but he's writing to them with the assumption that they're very familiar with the Old Testament and what's been written in the New Testament so far, so he, 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 he almost speaks in, in, in code language, often. He makes very, God is love. Now, he doesn't bother to stop and, 
explain that or why he said that or whatever. He just assumes that you have, your, your brain is going to put all you together, everything you know from the Old Testament and the New Testament so far, and you're going to say, yes, that's true. We know that's true. And he's going to make, sin is, is, is rebelliousness. Okay? You know, immediately you're going to think about places that fit that picture. So he's writing to people that he thinks are in the know, if you will, which is interesting because that would be Gnosticism. Yeah. If you're in the know, right? <laughs> sort of interesting, tongue-in-cheek kind of. A. So now the message we have heard from his son announces that God is light, and there is no darkness at all in him. Now, John loves to contrast things. So here's light and darkness. If then we say that we have fellowship with him, yet at the same time live in the darkness, we are lying both in our words and in our actions. But if we live in the light, just as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from every sin. Okay? Now, one of the major issues here in John is going to be, how does the blood of Jesus purify us from sin? We'll get back to that in a moment. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and there is no truth in us. But if we confess our sins, he will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our wrongdoing. Now, how does verse 9 fit with verse 7? If we say that we have not sinned, now 8 and 10 go together. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. And we really need to read chapter 2, verse 1 to go with it. I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Okay. Now we have a, we could spend the rest of the evening talking about the ideas in those few verses. What do you think of verse 7 and 9? You know, right here it says, uh, um, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. Mm -hmm. If you use my understanding, the blood is symbolic of life. Okay. And Jesus' life is what demonstrates, even Paul says it's his, his uh his death reconciled us to God. Okay, where where do you think they first got the idea that blood represents life? Well, uh, Genesis uh, nine, 9, verse 4. Right. Genesis. And it leaks out and you're dead. Yeah, well, and that's that's a very simple example. They recognize that if, if a person gets seriously injured and their blood starts, or even a lamb, and, you know, you cut his throat at the, as a sacrifice and the, and the blood leaks out, and what happens? The life is gone pretty soon. Yeah. So well, you know, the you life must be in the blood. You don't take blood and splash it on yourself and that cleanses you. Um, yeah, you notice that too. And so when they say the blood of Jesus cleanses you, then they mean the life and the death because that's what happens when uh, the blood flows okay. or the blood is taken out. Uh, he, his life, the blood flowed when he was alive and the blood was taken out when he was on the cross. So Jesus' life and death cleanses us. But splashing blood on us doesn't cleanse us. Go ahead. Now what do you mean by cleanse? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jesus' life and death shows us the li uh, God and God. Shows us what God would do if he were a person. And when he dies, um, how does it affect my sin? Um, it um, it this gives really you ins it gives you inspiration. It shows you who God is. That God is not this horrible God that you've been hearing about. A God is as gentle as Jesus with the little kids, and as gentle with Mary as he was with Mary Magdalene when she was sinning. And actually, God dies for you. Uh, you know, but all an that's important thing, the important thing about blood, too, is commitment. Because if I make a, a vow, if I promise something to you, what's my highest thing I can, I can um, say, if I don't do this, you can have? Mm -hmm. It's my life. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to make a commitment, you know, and you, and you fortify it with your own blood, you know, that's, that's another important thing with the symbol of blood. It's, it's a promise, it's a commitment, it's a big commitment. 
And Jesus made that commitment to us with his life and his blood. That's right. To purify us this from his it. death on the cross. James is, is, is talking here, if we have fellowship and walk that, it says we have fellowship one with another. And it, it, he ties this, this life of Jesus. If we walk in it the way he walked, then all of a sudden we're walking together. And the word, the word that him. is translated and together with him. Is, is cleanse in English. What is, Greek word is that? Is it has to the do with I, I believe I'm pretty sure restoration is, is it, could that be part of it to restore or yeah, what? Sure, sure. Okay, so Romans five ten. We are reconciled by his death, but we are healed or saved by his life, mm -hmm. and by observing his life, learning from his life, and and modeling ourselves after his life. Then okay, we, does that make oh, sense? Well, all of all of you. Now let's. I want to. I want to pull the pieces together that you're talking about. What we're really saying is, it's not the physical blood that makes a difference. We're saying it's the ideas, the meaning, the teachings of his life and death that make a difference. Okay? So that word blood is symbolic of his life. Symbolic of his life and his death. Okay. It's okay. almost a pointer also. Yeah. I guess the question, what went wrong and how does this Take set it right? Question. So what, what, if, if the way I would say it, in the minimum number of words is like this, and obviously this implies a lot of things, but we are, by the life and the death of Jesus, we are given a choice. We will either choose to live the kind of life he lived, or we will die the kind of death he died, which is the death, the, the second death, right. the death of sinners. So the life and the death of Jesus gives us a choice. Here, here it is. Well, I don't know if we're strong enough to live like the life of Jesus, but it shows us who God is. Yeah. And, and that is like, oh, this is who God is. Um, mm -hmm. He's not something that uh, we have false conceptions of. Yes. That's intellectual. Doesn't it get more personal than that and affect what you do? Yes, it does. Well, first it has to hit me intellectual, and then it gets personal, I guess. But the point is this. The... We are told, there's one thing we're told to do, basically, as far as this part of the Christian life. There's some other things that go along with it, but the one thing we're told to do is have faith. What does faith do? We're told that salvation is by faith, righteousness is by faith, justification is by faith, sanctification is by faith, all those things through Scripture. Well, all of a sudden, we're, which part of those things do we do? We have faith. The only part we can do is faith. God does the salvation, the righteousness, the justification, the sanctification, all that. That's God's part. You know, and we, we spend all our time arguing about God's part. How does he do his part? No, let him do his part. We need to talk about the faith. Okay, what is faith? Faith is the relationship. Faith is, is, is the thing that says, God, I trust you in my life. I trust you that your choices for what's good for me as I look at the life of Jesus, your choices for what's good for me are better than my choices. I, my human nature says I'd like to do this, but I know you would like me to do this. Okay, God, do I really believe that your choice is a better choice than my choice? Can I, can I honestly make that statement? If I can, and then I'm move, moving in that direction. By beholding, we become changed. Uh, you know, Second Corinthians and, and, and great controversy in lots of places. But um, we're going to have to take a break right now. But think about it. What does that mean to you? What difference does that make in your life in the 21st century?
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Did you get the answer to that question? <laughs> well, it's a big question. It's a serious question for Christians. It's a question of would we rather spend our time watching movies on television or on the internet or at the movie theater, or would we rather spend our time thinking about how we can live the kind of lives that Jesus lived? Do we love and care for our fellow human beings instead of doing selfish things we'd rather do ourselves? It's, and again, it, another way to put that is, are we going to live selfish lives or are we going to live loving lives? And John is going to go on to talk exactly about all the implications of that as, as he moves forward in this book. And, and ourselves, we can't decide we're going to live love, uh, loving lives, helpful lives. We have to say, God, help us live those lives yes. because there's no way. Well, I, like I said, our part is the faith. I can say, God, I trust you. I trust you. I will do my best to follow your directions. I trust you. Okay, you do the, all those Please other things. Please help me like uh, doing what's right. Well, you know, if you value some behavior, you're going you're gonna to absorb it sometime. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something. But what if I don't value it? Well, that's... that's well, that... Well, I what's mean, the use of I, your faith then? I like Jesus, and I like... But what if I don't value... Uh, how, can you, how can you love Jesus and not value those things? Oh, your old, your your yourself in you doesn't want to. Uh, let's oh, that's say the problem. That's, that's I love Jesus, I but um, like I like to lie, and I'll keep lying and yeah, lying. You know, if if a person sins, they sin for a reason. I mean, if they don't make it to Selfish heaven, sense. there's a reason for it. Um, it's got to be different than well, what you're talking about. An alcoholic, or a drug person, or a person that just eats too much, or whatever. That's not something that Jesus would do in his life, but you can't but you stop can, that I'm on your sure own. that all these people that eat so much wish that they wouldn't eat so much, and that yeah, but they, they do it again and skinny again. And 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 you know, I think after a while, um, I think you have to. I think to the way may may open towards there'll be something that shows that you want to go that way, even though if you might not make well. Here's, here's so, and, and John deals with that. That's exactly what this book is all about because a little ways along, now a couple chapters from now, he's going to say sin is rebelliousness. Now, the King James Version is a very free translation. It's almost a living Bible kind of translation when it comes to that verse. It says, sin is the transgression of the law. That's a very, very free translation. It's hamerti estin anomia. Hamerti estin anomia. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is rebellion. So here's the question. God knows that sin damages us. Do we believe that? Well, you know, like I knew a somewhat nice man, and uh, he said he wanted to be a Christian. He says, but I'm no sheep. <laughs> and the thought of being a sheep just revolted him because he was very... Um, rebellious in charge and so I think God has to sh change your desires and to be cooperative or, or something but uh, the mm -hmm. thought of being a sheep just revolted him yeah well so uh, this is the problem do we are we going to be selfish and therefore be rebellious and rebellious therefore sinners against what against the okay Here's the, here's the how choice. Do, how do you show rebellion without violating the law? Well, well you are violating, uh, violating the so law. So that's transgression of the law. Well, but it includes a lot more than that. You, you might, Paul would have said before he became a Christian, I obey the whole law. He would have, the rich young ruler said, I obey every one of those commands. And superficially he did. But inside, he was a rebel. The problem was the twelfth, I mean, the, the yeah, tenth right. one. Okay, but you can't see that. Okay, <laughs> that's the problem. That's why I say the, the problem is inside there, and, and you've, got, you've got to get down to that root level. You've got to say, okay, God, do I believe? Do I believe your facts? Do I believe, as I read through the whole Bible, do I really believe 
that it's true that you have a better plan for me than I have for myself. Now, if I think that my plan for my life is, my selfish plan for my life is better than God's plan for me, you can guess where I'm going to go. Okay. And we all do this. Temporarily, every time we commit a sin, what we're really saying is, God, right now, I like my plan better than your plan. It's really what we're saying. I want to be a rebel instead of being a saint. And eventually, some of us are going to have to figure out, okay, God, I believe that your plan is better. I'm going to do it your way, with your help, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And a group of, if a group of people do that and come together and do it together, this whole great controversy will be over. You know, that speaks for prayer, because when you are praying, you're thinking, what is God's way? Mm -hmm. Where you, if you just sort of uh, skip along through life and you never even uh, consider God's way, of course you're going to go your way, your way, your way. Mm -hmm. And prayer is a time when God will sort of nudge you in another way. It'll make you stop and think. Now I have a decision here, a fork in the road. Which way do I want to go? Yeah. So it takes time to think of God's way. It's not something that is instant. Yeah. The Bible is filled with people who were, did not always do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, but there were, but God, you know, God, well, God never gives up. Mm -hmm. But we've got we've God. got a lot more to cover in this book. We're taking okay. a brief time to to a few more minutes to try to finish First John. Look at Second First John two verse eighteen. Uh, my children, it is the last hour. Written two thousand years ago. Almost, well, I guess 1,900 years ago, more or less. Well, was he talking about everybody or himself? Well, what about that? <laughs> because he's pretty he, he's, old. He's talking about, uh, just as you heard, the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Not my last hour, the last hour. So he's saying that Antichrist are creeping in the church already then. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that Antichrist is someone that has stayed away from the church until the very end. He's saying Antichrist is creeping in, and Antichrist is something that is against Christ, not Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 22, it defines what uh, oh. Antichrist is. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Now, remember, in our, in our discussion earlier that about the, the human versus the divine, Jesus is this is his human name. Christ is his divine name. So what Jesus is the Christ. He says, Jesus is human and divine. So oh. there, just that's the way he, the way he puts that that's together. That's interesting. So Jesus is the human, mm -hmm. and Christ is divine. So Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yep. Christ well, is anointed. Christ means um, is a, Greek, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word for the anointed one. Which is set apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Before you go on, I'd just mm -hmm. like to say a little something. You know, a lot of Christian people, they don't understand something. They think the Antichrist, okay, this, the one Antichrist is coming, which is true, mm -hmm. but they missed out on that verse that you just read, which said, many Antichrists have already come. Mm -hmm. And in fact, since the time that that was written, Many, many more have also come, and there are many, we see them sometimes, they call themselves the Christ, or they put themselves in that place. So let's be very careful and not be deceived and stay close to the Word and yes. well, there close to others worshiping the same Paul. God. There's plenty of them following Paul. I yeah. Think going. Well, it's just anybody that's against Christ, against mm -hmm. the ways of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's sort of, um, everything deteriorates. Uh, like if you have a house, you've got to repair, paint, whatever. And it seems like Christianity is the same way. It's constantly, Satan is constantly trying to deteriorate it. And so this book is saying you've got to uh, keep repairing this and repairing this and keeping the place good, keeping mm -hmm. it. And so everything on this earth is deteriorating, even Christianity if we let it. Ellen White had some interesting words to say about that. Jesus is the Christ kind of idea, whether God could become human and so forth. These are found in the little book that I, am, that I May Know Him, page 338. Had God the Father 
come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself. <coughs> now, you can imagine this, veiling his glory that humanity might look upon him. That would be completely impossible for a, for a Gnostic. Veiling his glory that humanity might look upon him. The history that we have of the life of Christ, notice his divine name, would not have been changed. And every act of Jesus, now his human name, and every reason of his instruction, we are to see, hear, and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, there's your handling, touching, all that. Mm -hmm. It is the voice and movements of the Father. I think that summarizes it very well. It, it puts quite a hole in that notion, watch out for the Father, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, because mm -hmm. they're identical yep. in this, this verse. Exactly. Uh, move on to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. That's a very famous verse that everybody has probably memorized at one time or another. And again, we, we, we talked about that um, a, little, a little bit ago. What is, you, you have different versions. Which version do you have? The King James. Can you read 1 John 3, 4 for us? Whosoever committed sin transgress also the law. Mm -hmm. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's that free, very free translation I was talking about. Does uh, someone have a translation that's quite different than that? RSV. Okay. Sin is lawlessness. Wow. What a change, huh? So, again. <laughs> not really. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds very different. Well, it's, it's a different word, yes, right. but the concept is identical. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but the, you, you can see the difference here. You see, the King James is talking about, and, and if a good Jew, a good Pharisee in Jesus' day said, the transgression of the law, I know what that is. Those are the Ten Commandments. Those are all those other ceremonial laws. And I will do those things if it kills me. And I've got my guaranteed ticket to the kingdom. If you say sin his, is... His problem isn't in the definition of the law. His problem is that he doesn't understand the law at all. Well, but his, <laughs> he, he, would say, he would say, according to this, trans, this definition, he's a faithful saint. According to that definition, he's got a problem. According Re to, if he's, a rebel. Well, he yeah. would say he's not. Well, how do you tie him with lawlessness? He keeps the law. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you got to have the law. I mean, to, to be I don't. I have a trouble with this distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah, it's it should be the same, but uh, uh, down through the centuries, it has not been interpreted in that same way. That's that's a. I mean, we just want to make that careful. I mean, again, I hope that all of you have always understood that verse correctly, but maybe some of you haven't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's go to another verse that's, that's very well known. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Um, by the way, if uh, we, we, we didn't spend much time in, on the, it is the last hour, what do you think John was talking about there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Time is short. Time is short. Well, you know, he's the one that wrote Revelation. Maybe he mm -hmm. thought that was coming quicker than it is. Well, it is. Hey. Well, he. What do you mean he wrote Revelation? He was. He took down what he saw. God <coughs> showed him the stuff, and he just. He just wrote it down. Okay, I didn't so say that. So it isn't right. like he. It wasn't like he knew exactly what he was. Well, he writing saw, down he either. He saw all that, and he wrote what he saw. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Eight verse eight and four. Is that what yeah. you're looking for? My Good News Bible says, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if you drop down to verse 16, it says, and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. So, I mean, we must have all heard this idea, God is love. We talked a little bit earlier about the idea that sin is basically selfishness. I want to do it my way kind of thing. God is the love, God's way is the loving way. I, I want to do what's best for my neighbor. I want to do what's, be, what's best for everybody else. Because I believe that if, if I do everything like that, for, and I'm always helping other people, and I'm serving God's side, what will happen to me? I will make a choice. 
I'll make a choice. But if, if, if I end up living in a world where everybody is looking out for everybody else, what happens to me? You get taken care of. You get taken care of. That's exactly right. Now, and verse we, 20 we, and 21 would help along with that. Go ahead. Uh, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, that's the taking care of each mm -hmm. other, uh, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, he who loveth God loves his brother also. I grew up with a brother. Did you have a brother? I did. <laughs> and you always loved him, right? Yeah, well, he was smaller than us. <laughs> I mean, younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my brother was just a little bit younger than me, and we managed to fight like some other siblings that I've heard about. Um, I, I was really puzzled. In my younger days, I was really puzzled by this verse. I mean, you know, I think that you can know, you know your brother too well. That's the problem. You know about all his quirks and his problems, and, and that's why you want to fight with him, right? Yeah, but just let some third party come in and pick yeah. on him and, and see how much division there is. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way it happens for you know, sure. The other thing about love, though, um, that word in English seems like it's just some kind of thing that you would never hurt anybody, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. But sometimes love is tough. I mean, you said you do what's best for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. That may not be... What very, you want to do. Well, yeah, it may not be what you want to do. It may not be what he wants you to do either. But, um, mm -hmm. but uh, that would be down here in this sinful world. Because <coughs> yeah, but when we, get, invo that when that we get involved in that kind of situation, we're dealing with a, with a problem that has selfishness at the basis of it. But in heaven, where we're going to have this system where everybody takes care of everybody else, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> You don't have that sin. So there's not a problem with that. You don't think there'll be any challenges in heaven? Everything's <laughs> going to be easy? I think everybody's going to do <coughs> nice things for everybody else. Continually. It will be so nice. Everybody else will be so nice to you that you'll want to be nice back to them. I think in heaven the challenges are going to be intellectual. They're going to be uh, composing music. They're going to be uh, growing and gardening. And so you're going to get challenges. You, we just don't need the sinful challenges we have on this earth. But I think heaven okay, will be a little better to me heaven will I be don't want heaven to be slurpy. Heaven no. will be very <laughs> fulfilling. I mean, I think it will be exciting when we don't have to take care of all the problems and we can just get on with the fun little projects. Yes. You know, ladies will be making quilts, maybe. Who knows? You know, and uh, God can get on with his teaching. Mm -hmm. He used to come down with Adam and Eve, talk to him, and teach him every day and uh, morning and night, apparently. And he can get on with with his teaching well, for the infinite I, one. What can we know about we'll, it? We'll be busy building a house, making the vines go here and there. We may not and need a, a shack. We may just I, be I, able to live out in the yeah. open. I think that I think that God. <laughs> That's what you would like. <laughs> let's, 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 imag let's imagine it a little bit. Suppose we come together on a Sabbath in heaven, and God says, "What'd you do this last week?" We say, well, this, oh, it was so exciting. I did this and this and this, and I learned this and this and this. And God says, hmm, next week, why don't you check on this and this and this and see what happens? I think it would be fun to talk to some of the other beings in the uh, heavenly place or some of the angels. Uh, hey, what, what was your perspective? What did you, what did you see? Uh, how did you understand what was going on? Yeah. What did you I mean, get, get inside their head a little bit? I think be... Yeah, exactly. And travel. Yeah. We can travel. Yeah. <clears throat> see other planets. Now, let's remember that when we talk about love here in 1 John, it's always agape. We're not talking about the slurpy that... <laughs> the well, how come we don't translate it to agape? Then people would say, well, what does agape mean? Yeah. Well, it means love, but not exactly. Always doing the you right know? thing. Agape is a principle love. You do what is right because it is right. Mm -hmm. And that's the important part, okay? But, but that... It's kind of falling out of the word of L O V E. Yeah. Is that's kind of falling out. We have we have we've gotten the place where we've made love to be everything under the sun: sentimentalism, uh, sexual orgies. I mean, you know, everything seems to come under the the rubric of love now. Love the car, love the house, love the yeah. 
when we talk about love your brother here, who is who is our brother? Is it only people in our denomination or the everyone? Of of course, in in John's day, it would have would have applied especially to the people within the churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be especially true. But at the same time, uh, it, it includes everybody else. The, the, and there's no problem using that same in the churches to <clears throat> this time either. No. We got enough rankling going on that we could do away with a lot. <laughs> yeah. So coming back to our verse, I still don't, we, I guess we've talked a little bit about the 218. It's the last hour. Let me ask you this question. We sort of pass it over like that's nothing. He said it was the last hour. Was he right or was he wrong? He's right. It is the last hour. We're in the final moments of it. Okay. And, he was uh, writing this, this thousands of years ago. Yeah. That's true. Well, this, this whole scenario has been going on for thousands of years, and Jesus on the cross is kind of the culmination of it. Now we're living in the very end of that. And because it is the last hour, I noticed that John sometimes is writing some things that may seem very hard and very harsh mm -hmm. because he's excited, he wants people to understand, get right with God, stop sinning. But I also noticed that several times throughout the book of John, First John here, mm -hmm. he sprinkles in the love in there and he says, you know, you, we have someone who will fight on your behalf with the Father, that's Jesus, to you know, forgive your sins. And, and I notice over here in uh, chapter 5, verse 16, if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to life. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, he's not trying to say it's okay to sin. He's made that very clear, do not sin, very strongly. But he's also saying, don't beat yourself up either because we have Christ Jesus in heaven. We give, didn't give me a list of the sins that don't lead to death. Well, all sin leads to death, but okay. we have Jesus Christ as our Savior, and He saves us that's from a our sin. That's a solution. There the isn't, there, there isn't a sin that doesn't lead to death if it remains. The sin that but if Jesus, if Jesus saves us and forgives us, then it did not lead to death, as John kind of alludes to here. So it's, it's a very delicate balance. I remember in James, James is very hard, you know, don't sin and this and this. Well, but know, if we read the very last sentence of James, he kind of opens the door back up for love and salvation and forgiveness. You know that uh, the, the Christian church down through the generations has developed what they call the mortal sins and the venial sins. Now I, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I um, don't claim to be an expert on any of those. I hope I've done not too many of the deadly sins. <laughs> but there's the seven deadly sins. And, of course, those include murder and adultery and those kinds of things. Um, and every one of us knows that there are some things that we consider worse sins and some things we c consider less sins. Uh, is there really a difference? Are you talking about the unpardonable sin? Well, that's another category. Unpardonable. If so there's a category above that, what you were talking about? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I don't think so. Not in my mind, but I guess is, some other people can Is there a that. difference? Between a deadly sin and the unpardonable sin? No, between sins. Yeah. Everyone, we, we, we all make a habit of lying. All the time. We, we come in in the morning, we feel lousy. We, maybe we got a cold, whatever, like this. And someone says, how you doing? Fine. Fine. <laughs> but I don't think we're consciously lying. It's just to just keep on going. I don't think we... Cut off conversation. <laughs> yes. I don't think we're consciously lying. So it's an unfriendly lie. <laughs> just cut off the conversation. Yeah. But we've all uh, make lies, degrees of lie. You know, yeah. this is a little white lie. This is a terrible lie. Lie is lie. And doctors, unfortunately, in our profession, sometimes don't tell patients the whole story about their diseases when they first discover yes. the truth. Um, 
Now about lies, Jesus said, even if you thought it, you've yeah. done it. And if you've broken one, you've broken all of them. And it kind of seems that there's a little verse there that says this was done so that no one would put themselves above somebody else. Mm -hmm. So sin is sin. We're all guilty. We're all sinners. As they say in Latin, mea culpa, I'm guilty. But we do have a Redeemer who takes away sins, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. But we have to be aware that we're sinners. Yes. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. We have and to I come to him, and as Norm would like to point out, mm -hmm. we need to stop the rebellion. We need to stop rebelling against him. But we're, we're people, and we, and we have we've, sin around us. We've got just a couple minutes left. There's one more thing I really would like to touch on before we leave First John. It's found in, in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. And it talks about people who came into the church for a while and then they left. It says, these people really did not belong to our fellowship, and that is why they left us. If they had belonged to our fellowship, they would have stayed with us, but they left so that it might be clear that none of them really belonged to us. So does that mean as we, we conduct a huge evangelistic series and we bring in 100 people and then a, you come along a year later and there's 10 left, that the other 90 weren't really, didn't really belong? Yes. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Some people have to think about it longer than others. And God may bring them back and they may be the proverbial prodigal son. And it's possible that the evangelists may not be the true church either. <laughs> well, it's interesting that, of course, this has been a big concern for churches. And some very interesting research has been done about why some people don't stay and why other people do. And if you're going to stay with the church, this is what they have found. There are three really important things to help you stay in the church. And you have to have at least two of those three if you're going to stay. One, you must be reasonably convinced that the doctrines that the church teaches are correct. That's one possibility. You must make real friends among the church members. And three, you must be, get involved in church activities. So any two of those three will keep you in. If you only have one or if you have none, you're on your way out. It's something to think about. Think about what's happening in your church. And think about this little letter of First John and all that it implies about the kind of Christians we should be. And we'll be talking about the other letters of John next time. See you then.